Martin. He's a strategy consultant as well as an author of Fightnomics. So welcome, Reed, and thank you for coming. You guys can hear me okay? Good. Okay, um, well, first of all, you're taking a big risk already by stepping outside of baseball, football, basketball into a lecture on cage fighting and analytics because I'm sure most of you don't realize that there are analytics for professional cage fighting. There are. Uh, it's still pretty young, though. So I feel like I have a lot of ground to cover, and we actually are going to start with some of the more basic stuff, um, which is hacking the tail of the tape, what actually matters uh, when you see that tail of the tape pop up on the screen. Uh, and so I believe that this is a very fitting um, subject for the evolution of sports series because, believe it or not, uh, there are numbers. This is one of the first things I encountered. Surely you can't be serious that there's actually statistics for two guys in a cage. Uh, well, I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. So what are the stats? Do you actually count the number of times a guy gets punched in the face? Actually, yes, we do, uh, but that's actually 12 different variables in the system that we have. So there's a very rich database out of over 100 variables that you can look at round by round, fighter per fighter, and actually see what's going on during a fight. Uh, so a step back, why is this so fitting for evolution? Uh, this is one of the few sports that actually exists outside of our own species. Uh, this, this is agonistic behavior in cats. You can see them posturing and squaring off. You can see kangaroos kickboxing. Uh, here's a couple of our cousins, apes. Uh, they thump their chest, gnash their teeth, and they actually engage in hand fighting, which is uh, wrestling, and actually trying to get dominant position on one another. So if you fast forward through history and you look at two cage fighters facing off, they actually exhibit a lot of the same behavior. Uh, so it's very fascinating from an evolutionary biology standpoint. These two guys are about to fight, and you can tell. And they're, and they're making it known, and they're posturing. And it's, it's really cool to watch uh, up close. And, and if you thought it was all wrestling, this is kangaroos doing jujitsu. This is a rear naked choke actually recorded in the wild by a kangaroo. I, I did not put these subtitles on there. It's, it's almost creepy. Um, but don't worry, the other kangaroo did get up afterwards after a long fight. Uh, so leave it to humans to kick it up a notch. We uh, created pancreation. We merged the first ever recorded mixed martial arts fight way back in the early Olympiad. Uh, and now we have these very complex arts of striking and grappling, submissions, wrestling, all put together literally in a cage together. So um, we're familiar with expressions like a reach advantage or a southpaw advantage. But no one's ever really put numbers behind that to say how much of an advantage is that? Is it real? If so, how does it work? So we're going to explore those ideas, and then we're going to get into some other ones a little bit later. Uh, so MMA 101, of course, it's striking and grappling, thrown in the cage together. Uh, it's evolved very quickly over the last 20 years that it's been televised, at least by the UFC. Uh, it's now highly regulated. There are weight classes. There are a lot of rules. There are judges, referees, uh, point systems. Uh, and it's a lot of styles all competing together. Uh, so it actually has come a long way in a short time. Uh, and so let's take a, a step back. And actually, I just said that. In the UFC, you can have fights that end by three different ways, uh, decision, knockout, or submission. So a very, very high level look is just to look at, well, how did all the UFC fights in history actually end? And you see the red area is TKOs, knockouts, the blue area submissions, and then decisions in gray. And you might say, okay, well, interesting. Um, most fights actually don't even go to the judges. Uh, but this is a very macro, macro look, and I don't think it's very informative. Um, modern MMA looks a little bit differently. So, here it is by weight class, and what you see instantly is that there's a trend there. Uh, the red area, the knockouts, uh, increases with the size of the fighter, so perhaps size really matters. Uh, how do we test that with data? Well, believe it or not, uh, there's a lot of metrics. So round by round, we can actually look at the knockdown rate uh, for fighters by weight class, and here's what that looks, at, looks like. So we just went from a big macro picture to a very tight one. This is what I call the knockdown rate. This is a knockdown score divided by the number of power head strikes landed. Uh, and what you see is that there is a very consistent upward trend. So the bigger the fighter, the harder they fall. Uh, more specifically, the more mass they can put into a knockout. Um, I will discuss some of the physics of a knockout in a second. Uh, but that's a, that's a way that we can test an idea. So we saw a big picture, and now we saw a very specific picture using very specific round-by-round -round data. So here's the tail of the tape. This is what we're used to seeing. Any boxing match, any MMA match, we've seen this. It's basic anthropometrics. It's age, height, weight, reach. Uh, they left off stance, but I would argue that that's also anthropometrics um, and nationality. And so that's all we're working with. It's a very limited data set, and yet there's a lot we can do with that. So here is the average height and reach of fighters by weight class. Um, it's obviously 
there's a strong fit there in the trend line. Uh, the, uh, you go back in time, Leonardo da Vinci actually believed with the Vitruvian man picture that the length of your outstretched arm should be equal to that of your height. That would be a ratio of 1.0. Um, in actuality, he was really, really close. Uh, in modern day, it's 1.02, so your arms are, tend to be a little bit longer than your, than your height. Uh, in the UFC, it's actually 1.03. In the NBA, for reference, it's 1.06, so it's actually long arms are really valuable in basketball. But here it is in cage fighting. Uh, here's the average size. And if you fast forward, this is how that has changed over one decade. The average guy in a weight class has grown by an inch in both directions, which is a lot of growth for just the decade. Obviously, these people aren't growing themselves. They're, they're dropping weight. Uh, and so they're packing more frame into the same amount of weight on the scales. And if you, if you overlay where the champions tend to fall, this is all the average height and reach of weight classes. If you overlay uh, champions, they tend to fall on the right side of the graph. So we're seeing our first clue that maybe reach is a little bit more important than height. So the vast majority of champions, all with the exception of one in the heavyweight division, and that's a big spread of a, of a division, they are all longer than their peers. They are not all taller. In fact, in most cases, they're not taller. And so if you isolate these from each other, you begin to get a clue as to what actually matters in a fight and how you can properly read the tail of the tape. So let's isolate the reach advantage. This is the win percentage for fighters where all things are basically equal except reach. And what we see is that if the reaches are equal, obviously there's a 50-50 win rate. Up to about two inches, there is no effect. And then beyond two inches, we start to see this upward trend. These, these guys are winning more and more often. And in extreme cases, six and a half inch reach differential, they're winning like two thirds of the fights. So that one metric can actually be very informative. Uh, and it's true that the reach advantage should work in striking. So what I've done is actually isolate fights based on was it primarily standing or was it primarily on the ground? And what we see is that the reach advantage gets exaggerated in standing fights and it gets nullified or mitigated in, in fights that are on the ground. So that one idea, this long-standing tradition of whether or not there's a reach advantage does have some numbers behind it. We have quantified it. Uh, in general, if you're just looking for a basic stat, you could say, well, 57% of fights where a guy has at least a two-inch reach advantage, uh, it'll go to the longer fighter. What else can we do? Stance. You've heard the expression, the southpaw advantage. Uh, traditionally, the research to date has basically only looked at representation of southpaws. What percentage of them are there? Is there more than the baseline population, which for men is, is a little bit over 11%? And do they win more often? And that was basically the extent of all research into the southpaw advantage. There's been some very interesting hypotheses about how it works that is a selection frequency effect. Uh, basically, the rarity of being left-handed creates a temporary imbalance. It's a competitive advantage because people aren't used to facing you, which makes sense. That's what most fighters believe is going on because they say, hey, there's no one in the gym for me to train with when I, when I know I'm going to face a southpaw. So I ran those numbers, and those numbers are pretty easy to look at. It's not very complicated to say that this is the, this is the percentage of fighters that are, that are using an unorthodox stance in the UFC, and it is consistently above the baseline, almost two times the baseline, actually. And in head-to-head -head competition, they're winning 56% of the time uh, once we correct for other factors like age and reach. Um, so now we have two of these factors that actually lead to a meaningful trend. Going much deeper, and I can't go into all these numbers, uh, I do in my book, but basically the fighting hypothesis that facing a southpaw is awkward turns out to be supported by the evidence. There is no inherent difference in the performance metrics of a left-handed individual and a right-handed individual. What happens is that when they face each other, the right-handed guy just gets worse. And so when we look at this, and we say that they're, they're all basically equal, but in head-to-head -head competition, right-handed people simply perform worse in a variety of metrics. The southpaw advantage is actually so powerful, it even works against southpaws. Because even southpaws themselves aren't used to facing a left-handed opponent, they also see a drop in performance. Uh, and I thought that that was fascinating. Um, it means that there's a, a powerful trend here. It also means we should probably rename, it's not a southpaw advantage, it is a contra-southpaw disadvantage, although given the MMA community, I doubt we're gonna adopt that as a new name. What else is on the tail of the tape? This is the most overlooked piece of information on there, uh, the youth advantage. So using the same methodology, I controlled for fights where they are roughly the same size, they're using the same stance, except one guy is younger. And we see that there's basically no difference for a small age differential of up to four years. But beyond that, we start to see a big difference. And if you just take a rule of thumb and say, okay, how often do younger guys win when there's at least a four-inch age differential and all other things are equal? 
it's about 60%. So reach advantage, 57%, southpaw advantage, 56 youth advantage, 60%. Basic anthropometrics is looking at some of these trends. Now, trying to explain the youth advantage, uh, there is no real difference in how fighters perform in offensive metrics when we get into round by round data. There is a difference in how they lose. They are much more likely to lose by knockout than by submission. And the reality of, of it is I showed you the knockdown rate earlier increasing for bigger fighters. It goes, uh, it, it also increases, this is actually the inverse uh, metric. This is how many strikes does it take to knock someone down. And what you see is in their 20s, it takes a lot. And then it goes down and down and down to the point where in your 40s, it is a fraction of where you were in your 20s. Uh, the key to knockouts is, first of all, have a healthy brain. Uh, don't take a lot of damage. Don't leave your chin in the gym, as they say. Uh, don't take subconcussive traumas. But also, uh, have strong neck muscles. You know, if you're going to get hit, uh, you should work out your neck. Good research has been showing that uh, working out your, your splenius, your sternocleidomastoids, those muscles that stabilize your head, because the trick to a knockout is all about lateral acceleration. And in MMA, all of these strikes, head kicks, elbows, knees, uppercuts, hooks, crosses, they're all coming at an angle, and that's what causes knockouts. So what does the ultimate fighter look like? This is John Jones landing a spinning back elbow. In the background, you can see Joe Silva freaking out. That's uh, the matchmaker, that's his O face. Um, John Jones is currently the light heavyweight champion. He has the longest reach in UFC history. He has a uh, wingspan to height ratio that is over 1.10, uh, which is ridiculous. Uh, so he's, he might be the champ for a while. He's the ultimate, ultimate fighter from an anthropometric standpoint. Uh, but where else can we go? Uh, we can look at the tail of the tape actually had a little flag at the top, fighter nationality. Is there a home cage advantage in MMA? It turns out there is a little bit. It's, it's far more complicated to look at this because you don't fight the same fighter home and then away, uh, and then you just split the difference and figure out who wins more. It's a little bit more complicated. You fight one guy once, perhaps. Uh, but here, here are the home cage advantages for UFC nations. These are the big five countries that represent the vast majority of UFC fighters against major team sports, the NFL, MLB. And what you see is that most of the UFC countries end up on the bottom of the list. There isn't much of an effect, except for Brazil. Brazil has a ridiculous home cage advantage. Why is that? Well, it turns out that matchmaking has a lot to do with this. So those fighters were actually expected to win more often. Um, but in every case, we do see evidence that your home record tends to be higher than your away game record. Uh, so what, what is causing that? Is it just favorable matchmaking? Is there some crowd effect that we've seen in other sports like soccer where the, the loudness of the crowd can affect referee decision making, judge decision making? The judges are not Brazilian. They're actually American judges in most cases flown to Brazil. So it's not like there's some nationalistic bias, but there is crowd noise bias. And the Brazilian crowd is notoriously loud. The Japanese crowd way at the bottom of the list is notoriously quiet. So there may be some interesting dynamics going on there. Uh, we can test all sorts of ideas with this data. Uh, this is an example of ring rust. Does it, uh, it ring rust in boxing is if you've been away from the game a while, you come back. Uh, are you a little rusty in your first fight? Well, it turns out that that is true in MMA as well. Usually a long layoff means a bad injury, and it took you a while to recover. Well, we see that fighters who stay fresh and fight within an eight-month period tend to win more often than not. Once you go nine to 12 months, you're not winning as often. And then if you're out for over a year, bad news, you're only winning a third of your fights, just barely. Uh, I'm gonna skip through some of the other factors. Here's a fun one. Does astrology predict MMA performance? This, this crowd is an educated audience. Uh, this is exactly what you would expect to see if there was absolutely no relationship whatsoever. It's a noisy line that hovers right around 50%. Um, but I, you know, 40% of the population in America tends to believe in this stuff. Uh, I actually asked a lot of fans uh, who, what, what was a strong sign versus a weak sign, and we pit them head-to-head -head in the battle, and of course the win rate came out dead on 50%. No relationship whatsoever, but you guys knew that. Um, so a lot, I get asked a lot how predictive is this when it comes to gambling. Um, I will give you a quick anecdote. In college when I was studying physics, there was a sign on the door right outside of one of the test rooms that said, you can't win, you can't break even, and you can't get out of the game. And I just thought that that was some cold ass stuff to say to a guy right before he's gonna take a physics test. Um, it turns out that those are the three laws of thermodynamics paraphrased. They're also weirdly the lyrics to a Michael Jackson song, I don't know why. Uh, but the point is, is that you're dealing with a stack deck. When, you, when you're playing a game of chance, um, probability rules. Uh, when you're playing in a sports market, it's you against the market. And there is a margin built in. So actually beating the market requires you to beat the market significantly because you have to overcome that margin.
Here is how accurate historical gambling lines have been in the UFC. If we take the implied probability by the odds, that's the black line, and then we see how often do fighters in those categories meet that expectation. And the difference is that basically they don't catch the, the gambling odds. That margin is built in for the bookmakers to profit from. And that's very difficult to beat. But can you do it? That's a question. Can we use analytics to actually help us outperform the market? Here's a classic example. Here, the market pegged this fight as a pick 'em, which means, which first of all is very rare. Um, most fights, there's a clear favorite or underdog. But this one was a pick 'em. The, the guy in the right was released as an underdog, and then by the time the fight actually happened, he was a dead on 50 50. The market could not decide who was going to win this. But when we align analytics, performance metrics, based on these two performance in the UFC, we see a lot of check marks on the right side of the page. You know, this guy was an underdog, eventually a, an even matchup, but was it really even? If you look closely at analytics, you see that this guy had a lot of skill advantages favoring him, and actually having analyzed lots of these, let me tell you, I even predicted how the fight would end, because we saw a power striker facing a guy who had been knocked out several times, who, would, who likes to come forward, and we could see how this was gonna play out. And it did, in fact, the fighter on the right won by first round knockout, um, which was considering possibly an upset. Uh, are MMA gambling markets rational and efficient? I'll give you a hint. Most of the people placing bets are human. So what do you think? They're probably biased. They're probably uh, working with very limited information. And those, his those historical odds were very accurate, but they're basically based on uh, expert opinion, research, observation, watching old fights. They're not based on analytics. And so the experiment being run over the last uh, year or so has proven to be pretty good in that the combination of analytics and expert opinion and observation turns out to be a little bit better than market value. Um, and so if, if I find out that we can't beat the market using analytics, I'll come back here next year and tell you all about how numbers are worthless. I do not expect to have to give that speech. So in summary, I would say that numbers are already being used quite heavily in the sport just recently. We, we look at rankings, we look at betting odds, we look at the tail of the tape. Now we actually have some context for that. We understand what values are important, and there is a lot more that we can do. So we, we discussed anthropometrics, and we're explaining about 60% of victories. That leaves a big margin to explain with performance metrics, and that is the next realm of analysis uh, and we're doing it now. Um, there are predictive models, there are people that are, that are analyzing numbers, uh, and there is now the capability to preview fights based on performance metrics before they happen, look at them after they happen, what happened in the fight. Again, over 100 variables of what's going on round by round per fighter. And there is very good potential for motion sensing, pressure sensors. Imagine accelerometers in the glove where every punch that lands can be tracked real time. The problem right now is that judges don't have real time information. They're just using what they see, which is their own bias, and in a flurried exchange, they may not know what actually lands. So there is some, you could call it bias, but really it's just the limited capability of watching something real time at real speed. We tend to over reward activity in fighting. And so the more effective striker doesn't always win, the busier fighter often does. Uh, so there's lots of trends within the fight itself that we can see. I hope that uh, we can actually wire some of these guys up, and in the future, just like a fastball coming in, you instantly know how, uh, how fast it was, 103 miles per hour, you're actually going to know how hard a punch was that landed. And at the end of a round, you might say, well, this guy landed most of his punches with a strength of 7 out of 10, the other guy didn't land any above a 3. That's interesting information, uh, and it might actually change the way the sport is competed. Uh, so. That is the crash course. We have hacked the tail of the tape. We've previewed a few variables that are coming forward. I might even advance some of the slides to the background stuff so you can see some of the performance stuff, uh, but I will open the floor to questions. Uh, so you talk about the anthropometrics of fighters, and I'm curious, given the uh, disparity and sophistication between fight teams, do you see that Jackson Winklejohn and Zahabi have a better composition of fighters from an anthropometric standpoint than less sophisticated teams? Uh, knowing the TriStar guys, it's a great question. Um, I don't think that they are actively going out and looking at that uh, and recruiting that way. It is interesting that 
a bunch of guys at TriStar, this is one of the leading camps based out of Montreal, has ridiculous reach fighters. George St. Pierre had a huge reach. Um, Francis Carmon, Rory McDonald, Mike Ricci, they have a whole cadre of guys that all have the same body type. They're lean, they're long, and they tend to win decisions. Um, that, is, that is something to, to keep track of. I don't think they're doing it intentionally, though. I'm advancing slides so you can, while I'm talking, you can actually see some, here's all the success rates by submission, as well as the frequency with which they are attempted uh, in the background. I'm an avid MMA better. That was an amazing presentation. I really liked it. Oh, thanks. Um, question about striking. So a, a lot of times, like for instance, like the position before submission, you'll have a guy, is it taking into account a guy who's a better striker than a guy who just gets into a guard and grounds and pounds or he gets into mountains and stops the guy by strikes because in actuality, it's sort of a submission. Um, so knockdowns are the best way to measure um, the skill of striking. Yeah. Um, striking finishes can still occur in a grounded position. I don't think that's necessarily a measure of striking ability, stand-up striking ability in the classic sense. That's more of a submission type of... Um, it is, and in fact, sometimes it's actually classified as a submission if someone taps out. George St. Pierre actually tapped out when he was being beaten up by Matt Serra in one of the biggest upsets in UFC history. Um, I go through, and I would actually classify that as a striking finish. Um, for, for statistical purposes, it's a ground finish. Uh, but here's a chart that actually measures what is the accuracy of the fighters. This is the entire UFC middleweight division a year ago. What is the accuracy of their power head striking, which is the most important strike? What is the volume ratio? How often do they outwork their opponent versus counter-strike? And the size of the bubble is the knockdown rate. You see Anderson Silva way up there. He's a southpaw, and uh, he's got this huge bubble because he knocks people out with absurd rates. He's very accurate, but he doesn't, he's not a high volume guy. So in terms of measuring striking metrics, there are ways we can get to that, and I have to separate it from what happens in the clinch and on the ground, because those have entirely different dynamics and very different accuracy rates. Okay, awesome stuff. Can we get a copy of this somehow? <laughs> uh, I don't know, I think it's gonna be posted eventually, actually. Okay. Uh, it, or all of, most of these charts are in the book, honestly, Fightnomics. Yep, available on Amazon. Any other questions? Is there a reason why you went, why you're studying MMA instead of boxing, and and do a lot of the same principles apply in what would I'd imagine would be a much more simpler sport to analyze? <laughs> you're probably right. Um, I kind of lucked into this. I was working with some fighters, and at the time, Fightmetric is the company that created the raw data for all of this. They enabled all of this analysis, and CompuStrike I think exists. I didn't have access to that. I was more of an MMA fan. I believe that combat sports have evolved and. There's a couple guys still holding on to boxing, and that's, that's a debate we could have all day as to whether or not this is gonna replace, one is gonna replace the other. They still both exist. This is, to me, is human chess, whereas boxing is referred to as the sweet science. Uh, this is far more complicated, and it's just more interesting to me. So there's a lot more data uh, to work with, and it, and it just sort of happened that way. I happened to be an MMA fan. I, I bet basic anthrometrics for stand-up striking would probably be consistent in boxing. Any other questions? Uh, first of all, outstanding presentation, thank you. Um, are any current fighters or current gyms, do you think, uh, using this data to change the way they, the way they train and uh, tactically? So that would be one question. And second question is, are there any analytics uh, based off the judges, uh, whereas maybe certain judges favor a stand-up fighter versus a ground fighter? Um, et cetera. Uh, so the first question is yes. Um, I have been consulting with individual fighters, including a couple title fights. Uh, I've been doing that for a few years. I still think that the awareness in the industry that of what the variables actually are is still so limited that they don't know what they're looking at. I would do a, like a 35 page report for one client for one matchup. I would show him every fight he's been in in the UFC in excruciating detail. How did he do standing up? What was, what was the strike selection? How, how did the takedowns work? There's three different types of takedowns to look at, offense and defense, and in the clinch, shooting, upper body, lower body. There's so much data, um, I finally put that aside and said, fine, I'm just gonna write the book, explain how it all works, and then I can go back to actually consulting. Uh, so yes, the coaches, like Greg Jackson, who I have given reports to, they do believe that analytics are important. They are starting to learn from that. 
it is great at showing a fighter where he excels and maybe where there's a hole in his game, what they should work on. Uh, the second question about referees, I did run some analysis on uh, judging performance, how often they disagree. The rate of disagreement is shockingly high. Uh, so if it goes to a decision, one quarter of the time, the three judges who just watched the same two fighters compete can't agree on who won. Uh, the majority of the time, they can't agree on all three rounds. So disagreement is basically the norm. Uh, so I believe that they should be looking at analytics, they should be looking at areas of disagreement, and the athletic commission should say, should say why, why did one of the guys disagree with that? Let's talk about it, let's look at the numbers. Um, because I suspect it's usually because there was a differential in one of the fighters being busier, one of the fighters being more dangerous. When it's on the ground, they almost always give it to the top guy. Whereas stylistic bias, hard to say because I don't know what their biases are. Great, thank you so much, Reed, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.